in this video we're going to be looking at topic 2c gases in the atmosphere and this is part of the IGCSE chemistry course from Edexcel and we're going to be looking at these single science outcomes. So for single science you're required to note the approximate percentages by volume of the most four abundant gases in dry air. We also need to know how we can determine the volume of oxygen using different experiments looking at the combustion of specific elements in oxygen, as well as knowing that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas and how that contributes to climate change. So the composition of air that is in our atmosphere is made up of a number of different gases, but there are four that are the most abundant. And abundant just means common. So the four most common gases in dry, unpolluted air are nitrogen, at 78.1%, oxygen at 21%, argon at 0.9%, and carbon dioxide is much smaller than most people think. It is only actually 0.04% of our air. However, it can still have devastating effects to the climate, which we will talk about later on. The remainder of the percentages is made up of other noble gases, such as helium or neon but you're not going to be asked about these you're only going to be asked about the four that you can see in the table so when we're looking at the percentage of oxygen in air we need to understand three key experiments that we use to actually measure this percentage and you could be asked about these three experiments in an exam all of them depend on the reaction of a substance whether and the three substances are copper iron and phosphorus and they're all reacting with oxygen in the air and what we do is we measure how much oxygen has been removed from an air sample and that tells us how much um, percentage of the air was made up of oxygen so let's have a look at an example so if we use copper we have our copper and a silica tube packed very very closely together and we apply heat to that so we are of course then burning the copper. As this happens, you will see that we have got a gas syringe that is full of air. And as the copper burns, the plunger in this gas syringe is going to move and it is going to move downwards to reduce the amount of air. When the plunger stops moving, that tells you that the reaction is stopped and it shows you how much oxygen has been removed because you will start off at 100 centimetres cubed and you will reduce down to a different value. And when you do your calculation, you will be able to determine that the percentage that is lost is 21%. So if we look at how we do the calculation, we take the volume of air at the start, so in this case 100 centimetres cubed, at the end, your volume should be approximately 79 centimeters cubed. Now, of course, this is in an ideal situation. You may find that there's a slight error in your calculations, but that's absolutely fine. You can determine how much volume has been used by subtracting the air at the start and the air at the end, and you then get a value of 21. And what you do is you take the volume of oxygen and you divide it by the total volume and you multiply everything by 100 to turn it into a percentage. So in this case, we get 21 divided by 100 multiplied by 100 is going to give us an answer of 21%. We can also do this same thing, this time using the rusting of iron. So we take wet iron filings, and that's to encourage rusting, and we have oxygen as well. This one tends to be left for a while. You maybe need to leave it for about a week or so. And what you will see again is that the plunger will move and you will have a starting volume and an end volume. And when you do your calculation again, you will see that your percentage of air is 21 because the air, the oxygen is being removed as it forms iron oxide. And another name for iron oxide is rust. Lastly, we can do the same experiment using phosphorus, and this time we're using the displacement of water. 
So this is just another way as opposed to using a gas syringe where we can see how much oxygen is being used. So we have a trough of water and a bell jar covering an evaporating basin that has phosphorus on it. And inside this bell jar, we will have a starting volume of air. So we'll know how much air can be in this bell jar. What we then do is we light the phosphorus on fire and the phosphorus is going to burn and it is going to react to form phosphorus oxide. As this happens, the volume of water inside the bell jar is going to increase. That is because we are removing the oxygen and that causes a vacuum that causes the water to rise in the bell jar. And however much it rises by is going to tell us the percentage of oxygen. So we look at what the starting volume was and we compare it to what the ending volume based on how much water has risen. And again, we do that same calculation. So let's look at the combustion of specific elements in oxygen. So remember, combustion is just another word for burning. So when we burn magnesium, which is a silver metal, which is usually in the shape of a ribbon, and in oxygen, we're going to form magnesium oxide, which is a white powder. And this bottom picture shows an example of magnesium oxi oxide. So you can see that when it burns, you, by looking at the top picture, it is going to burn with a bright white flame. And this flame is actually so bright that you can't look directly at it or else you can do some damage to your eyes. So you should look at it from out of the side of your eyes and your peripheral vision. So we have our chemical reaction here that we have two magnesium atoms reacting with an oxygen molecule to form two magnesium oxides. This white solid can then be dissolved into water and we're going to form magnesium hydroxide and that is an alkaline solution. So we have MgO reacting with the water H2O to make MgOH2. Of course, having an aqueous sign to show that it is a solution. We can also burn sulfur and sulfur is a yellow powder as seen in the diagram here. And when we burn it in oxygen, we're going to get a very bright blue flame and it forms the poisonous gas sulfur dioxide. So you can see here that this is our blue flame. And in our equation, we're going to have sulfur as a solid reacting with oxygen gas to form SO2 or sulfur dioxide gas. We can then dissolve that into water and again we can form a solution and this time we're going to form sulfurous acid which is acidic. And you can see in the equation we have SO2 plus water to give us H2SO3. Notice that it is sulfurous, not sulfuric acid which is probably the one that you are most commonly familiar with. We can also burn hydrogen which is a colourless gas and oxygen and we get a very pale blue flame and we form water. Now this is a very very quick reaction to the point where it actually is an explosion. So we don't necessarily always see the flame as quickly, it just depends on how much hydrogen we're burning and you certainly don't see the water because it will be vaporised into a gas because of the heat, but we can, of course, burn the hydrogen and we can actually use that as a chemical test for hydrogen because it burns with a very dis distinct squeaky pop. And you will cover that in topic 2H. So when we make any sort of metal oxide, like magnesium oxide, these are going to be ionic compounds and they're going to contain this oxide ion, which is O2 minus. And metal oxides are what we call basic oxides. And that means that they can react with acids to form salts. So they are the opposite of an acid, they are a base. So they're going to have a pH above 7. Metal oxides tend to be insoluble in water, 
So for example, copper oxide is insoluble, but there are some that can dissolve. And when they do, they will dissolve in water to form metal hydroxides. And we call these alkalis because they contain this OH minus ion. So an example could be sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, or magnesium hydroxide, as we've seen already. When we have a non-metal oxide, these are covalent compounds because, of course, oxygen is a non-metal, and when we have two non-metals bonding, it is covalent bonding. These tend to be acidic oxides. So that means this time they're going to react with your alkali or your base to form salts. So these will have a pH below 7. Non-metal oxides are very commonly soluble in water and when they dissolve they are going to form these acidic solutions and they will contain this H plus or hydrogen ion. And an example could be our H2SO3, our sulfurous acid, or when we form HNO3, which is our nitric acid being formed from nitrogen dioxide. So the last part of this topic is to look at the greenhouse effect. So carbon dioxide and other non-metal oxide gases are going to form when we get things like fossil fuels being burned in industry. So any sort of combustion reaction typically is going to give off some of these gases. And carbon dioxide is what we call a greenhouse gas and it contributes to the greenhouse effect. So a greenhouse gas is a gas that is in our atmosphere that absorbs infrared radiation from the sun and that can be in the form of heat or we can also have light radiation and what that does when it absorbs it is it traps it in our atmosphere and that build up of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere causes the heat to be trapped instead of being radiated back out into space and by trapping that heat it causes our atmosphere to heat up and this is called the greenhouse effect. So you can see in this diagram, we have the sun giving off our heat. And what should happen is it should bounce and reflect back out into space. But when we get this buildup of greenhouse gases, we have this sort of trap forming here. And we have all of the gases and the gas is going to absorb the infrared radiation so when it is absorbed instead of it bouncing back it hits the top of the atmosphere and then comes back and then back and back and it continues to do that and it instead of reflecting into space it reflects within the atmosphere so all that trapped heat cannot escape and that causes the earth to get warmer and it causes the temperatures to rise and this can have devastating effects on our environment and we call this climate change. So as we increase the levels of CO2 in our atmosphere it is causing the greenhouse effect to become worse and worse and it contributes to climate change and the main effects that we have to know we don't have to go into too much detail about but just to be able to state them are we have our polar ice caps melting and that can cause rising sea levels, which could then cause extreme weather patterns. So we get things like floods and droughts and heat waves and our overall temperature of the earth is heating up or it could be drastically cooling down in winter. And that has an effect on a number of different species and plants and animals. So we want to try to limit as much carbon dioxide getting into the atmosphere as we can. So let's finish off by looking at a past paper question on gases in the atmosphere. So air is a mixture of gases and the table gives formula for three gases and their approximate percentage in a sample of dry unpolluted air. And we want to give the names of the two main gases. So our two main gases are going to be nitrogen and oxygen. Notice that it specifies the names. If you write N2 and O2, you will not get the mark because that's simply just taking it from the table. You have to actually give the name.
And then the name of the gas that makes up the remaining 0 0.96 of air, what well, is going to be argon. That was the fourth gas that we had to know. And the name of the gas that is present in polluted air that can cause acid rain. So acid rain you would have discussed in previous topics and you will talk about it again in the alkanes topic in organic chemistry. But the one that could cause polluted air, sorry, the one that causes acid rain will tend to be sulfur dioxide. Okay, carbon dioxide, whilst it causes global warming, does not cause acid rain. So the student used this apparatus to find the percentage of volume of oxygen in the sample of air. So she places some wet iron wool in the bottom of a test tube, invert the test tube in the beaker of water, so a beaker containing water, measure the height of the air in the test tube, and then leave it for a week and then come back and measure the height again. So what we should see is we should see the height going down because we have the oxygen being used up so the water level is going to rise. So some of the iron turned into rust and we want to give the word equation for this. Now another word for rust is iron 3 oxide and you will talk more about that in topic 2d the reactivity series so don't worry too much about that just now but we know how to write a word equation so we're going to have iron plus oxygen is going to form iron 3 oxide and then part two, use the student's results to calculate the percentage of oxygen in this sample. Well, first of all, we need to figure out how much oxygen was used. So the volume of oxygen is going to be equal to 80, take away 63, which is 17. And then I take that volume and I put it over my total volume. So my percentage of oxygen is going to be 17 divided by 80, times 100, which is going to give me a value of 21%. And then part E, the student left the apparatus for another week and measured the height of the column of air again. From this measurement, how could she tell whether all the oxygen had been used up? And it would be looking to see if we have had a further change. And if not, we would be saying that the height would stay the same. You cannot simply just say no change, you would have to say the height is stay the same as before. So there's the mark scheme for that if you want to have a look at the where the marks are distributed for this question. That's everything for single science uh, for gases in the atmosphere. If there's anything you're not sure about, please feel free to leave a comment below and we hope to see you back soon.